Okay, this is Wheelock's chapter two. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at nouns and their characteristics. We'll be introducing you to the idea of noun declensions. We'll talk about case functions and how nouns function within sentence constructs. And we'll talk about how we translate these nouns and Latin syntax. We'll also at the very end talk about adjectives and how they relate to nouns. So let's jump into it here. Nouns. We talked about verbs in chapter one. Uh, if there's a second most important word in a sentence behind verbs, it would be the nouns because it is the subjects of the action of verbs and it's the objects of prepositions and it's the direct objects that are being done, the actions of the verb. So let's talk about nouns. The word noun comes from the Latin word nomen, which means name. And nouns name or identify a person, place, or a thing. There are three characteristics of nouns. We have case, which is how the word functions in the sentence. Number, which is the quantity of the noun, either singular or plural. And then gender. Uh, this is, I don't know how to say that any better. It's the gender. It's the a construct that categories they put them in masculine, feminine, or neuter. So let's look at our options for all of these cases. We have nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, and vocative. Number, we have singular and plural as options. And as I mentioned a minute ago, gender, we have masculine, feminine, and neuter. I do want to make a quick note that actually there is another case um, a what six seventh one uh, it's the locative case and we'll talk more about that later but it's rarely used and so that's why it's not really mentioned much but I just just wanted to make a note that there is actually a let's see one two three four five six, yeah seventh <laughs> a seventh case and it is the locative uh, meaning location and like I said we'll mention that and talk about it a little bit later but for right now these are the ones you need to worry about so let's talk about declensions now. If you remember from chapter one, verbs are grouped according to the vowel stem at the end of the second principal part. Once you drop that RE infinitive ending and that gave you the vowel stem and each of the different groups were based on either a long A for first conjugation, a long E for second conjugation, short E for third, etc. Well similarly uh, nouns are grouped according to the endings that are attached to them. There we go. There are five different groups or declensions. Now this chapter we're only going to deal with first declension. The rest will be coming in the next several chapters. So first declension, the paradigm that we'll be using often for uh, the purpose of these videos is the word aqua. We'll look at that here in a minute. Second declension, we have a masculine and a neuter, filius and saxum. Third declension, nomen. Fourth declension, fructus for masculine. And fourth declension, neuter is cornu. And then fifth declension, space. So each declension has its own set of endings. Again, we're going to focus on first declension, and we'll look at the noun aqua, which I imagine you can figure out what that word means. Anybody want to venture a guess? Go ahead. Yep, that's right, it means water. Okay, so let's check out first declension noun endings. All right, here is the endings as we'll learn them. Uh, I, I, um, uh, uh, I, arum, is, as, is, I. Now, if you'll notice, several of these have a long mark or a macron over it. If you'll remember from your uh, reading from the uh, introductory cha uh, chapter dealing with pronunciation, the macron or the long mark simply means you will hold that sound out twice as long as the short vowel. So in reality what this would sound like is a, uh, I, I, um, a, uh, a, uh, I, arum, is, as, is, I. Now, I kind of exaggerated it just a little bit for effect and for clarity purposes, but you get the idea. Now, often when we're doing the chants, uh, we're not going to really hold, at least I'm not going to hold these out. And just for the purposes of practice, you can say them out loud five times at least. And for me, it would sound something like this. Do it with me. Uh, 
I, I, um, uh, uh, I, arum, is, as, is, I. So again, I'm not really differentiating between the A with the macron and the ablative singular and the A in the vocative singular uh, without the macron uh, for the purposes of chance. But when we're reading the text or reading Latin sentences, we will try to make the, uh, make the difference in, in how we pronunciation, pronounce it. Um, I also want to point out that vocative case, we're learning about vocative case right now, and we'll have it uh, up on the screen for these purposes, but eventually uh, our chants are going to drop vocative just because it's not used very often, and so our chants will simply have the nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative. But for right now, for this chapter, and I believe the next ch uh, chapter or two, we will include vocative. If you'll notice a couple of things here. Um, we have what we call the vocative rule, and that rule is this, that whatever is in the nominative, the vocative is the exact same. So here you can see in the nominative singular is an A, and vocative singular is an A. Nominative plural is AE or I, and vocative plural is I as well. Remember this diphthong, AE, is pronounced I, like the word aisle, A-I-S-L-E, the word aisle, that's how you pronounce that diphthong. So this is your first declension noun endings. You need to go ahead and learn these. And I would just practice them and say them over and over and over again if you need to make flashcards. Uh, but you, you really have to have these endings down. So let's, let's do them five times together. Say them out loud. It's actually better than just saying it in your head. I want you to hear these sounds. Let's do it five times together. Here we go. Uh, I, I, um, uh, uh, I, arum, is, as, is, I. Again. Uh, I, I, um, uh, uh, I, arum, is, as, is, I. Let's do it third time. I won't do fourth and fifth. Uh, I, I, um, uh, uh, I, arum, is, as, is, I. And you can get faster and faster as you go through it, but you just need to practice these endings. You need to get them down. So these are first declension noun endings. Well, how do we decline a noun? Just like we conjugated verbs by taking the base or the stem and adding the present tense verb endings, O-S-T, must not we're also going to decline nouns by taking the stem or the base and adding these noun endings that we just learned. So the word declinere or declining comes from the Latin word declinere, which means to change the direction or change the form. So thus, declining is changing the form of a noun by adding its base or stem to its declension endings. So similarly as verbs were conjugating stem plus endings, declining is taking the uh, noun stem and adding the declension endings. So verbs are conjugated, nouns are declined. All right. So how do we find the stem for a noun? Well, it's actually not very difficult. When you first are introduced to a word in your glossary or vocabulary list, you will see two forms listed, a nominative and a genitive singular. Every noun will also have its gender listed along with the definition or definitions of that noun. So here's an example. Aqua, aquai, and it's got the F, meaning it is a feminine noun, and it means water. And you will often see these abbreviated in a dictionary or glossary. And so here you have aqua and aquai, and it's abbreviated. The stem is not written out for the second word. It just has the ending. Uh, here's a quick note. First declension nouns are generally feminine. So almost all nouns in first declension are feminine. There are a few notable exceptions. And these are words that are masculine, and these were vocations or jobs in the first century that were not available to uh, women. They were only available to men. And this is words like nauta, meaning sailor. You're not going to find a, a female sailor. Uh, a pirata, a uh, pirate. You're not going to find a female pirate. Agricola, meaning farmer. Poeta, meaning poet. Scriba, meaning scribe. And a few others. But those are sort of the main common nouns you'll run into that are first declension masculine. But the far majority of them are feminine. All right, so let's take a look and see what this looks like. So we take the word aqua and aquai, as you see it in the dictionary, and you simply underline, here's what I, the process I tell students, underline the genitive ending. And if you learned your chant, you know it's a, I, A, E is the genitive ending, so you underline it. 
Draw a little line in front of it, and now that, everything to the left of that line, is your stem. So AQU is the noun stem. And if you take that noun stem and add it to all of those endings you just chanted, you've declined your first noun. Let's take, take a look at this. So here's our word, aqua aquai. And if we take that stem and add it to our endings, we end up with aquai, aquam, aqua, aqua, aquai, aquarum, aquis, aquas, aquis. Aquai. There you go. You can see there's the stem, A-Q-U, on each of these, and you can see the endings on the right side of the columns there. So the stem plus endings is declining. All right. We'll talk about how we translate this in just a minute. If you need to take a break, do so. I'm going to keep going, but if you, uh, if you need to take a break and let's sort of stretch your mind a little bit, go ahead and do that. But right now, I'm going to move on to case functions. What do these cases mean? Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative, and vocative. What in the world does all of that mean? Well, it's the function of how that word functions in a sentence. So for instance, a word that is in the nominative case is generally the subject of the sentence. It could also be a predicate adjective or a predicate nominative, which is a noun or an adjective after the verb in the predicate that describes or renames or restates the subject. But nominative case is the naming case. It's the subject. It's naming who's doing the action, essentially. Genitive case is what we call the limiting case. And it's most frequently, but not always, possessive. Uh, there are many uses, uh, many other uses of, of these cases, including genitive. But right now, I'm just kind of giving you the general generic uses for these cases. So for right now, what we're going to say is genitive is possessive. And you'll translate it as of, whatever it is. If it's a minute ago, aquai, it was of the water. If it was the subject, it would just simply be water and genitive of the water. Well, what about dative? Dative is an indirect object. That's how it's functioning in the sentence. It'll be the indirect object. And this is the person or thing that is indirectly affected by the action of the verb. And, and we will translate that as to or for whatever the noun is. So in the case, again, the case of aqua, aquai, aquai, dative singular is aquai, we would translate it as to or for the water. What about accusative? Well, accusative is the case of the direct object. It is the person or thing directly affected by the action of the verb. Uh, it could also be the object of a preposition with certain prepositions, but primarily for right now, the generic category we're going to say is direct object. And again, you just simply translate the word straight out. So the word aquam would be accusative singular, and you could say the boy drank the water. That's simply how you translate it, the water. Ablative case is generically the object of a preposition, and you can, sometimes it'll have a preposition in front of it attached to it, you know, uh, to help translate it, and sometimes it won't, and you have to supply the translation in the English uh, translation. And generally, we would say like by, with, or from something. So in this case, by, with, or from the water, like by the water. He, he, um, he swam with the water or in the water. He, he fell into the water. And so those are the prepositions you kind of use to translate it. So the ablative is what we call the adverbial case. What it's doing is limiting the verb, okay? We'll get into that more a little bit later. Vocative, again, not used a whole lot, and this is gonna go away in the sense that we won't be talking much about it, but you do need to have it on your radar. It's called the noun of address or calling. This comes from the Latin word voco, V-O-C-O, voco vocari, which means to call. Uh, we, we know about a vocation. If you were in the ministry, you have a vocation or a calling. So a vocative noun is one that is calling. And so if you were to say like, oh my son, how much do I miss you? Um, then you would put the word son in the vocative case. And it's simply whatever is the nominative ending is, is simply the vocative ending as well. So that's what translated would be O, either O-H or just a plain O, and then whatever the noun is. So these are the generic functions of cases. There are many others uh, that these categories, that these different cases can uh, fit into. But this is generic. So for right now, if I ask you, what is the function of a nominative? Your answer is subject. 
And if I ask what is the function of uh, genitive, you're simply going to say possessive. That's sort of the generic one we're going to go for. Dative, indirect object. Accusative, direct object. Ablative, object of a preposition. Invocative, calling. Okay, so what does that practically look like? We're going to look at how these cases actually function in a sentence. We're going to use an English sentence to start us off with, uh, something that we can relate to here. The poet gives a pretty rose to the girl. So poet is our subject. Uh, verb. Uh, the verb is gives. What is he giving? He's giving a rose. That's our indirect object being modified by the word pretty. It's the adjective modifying rose. And he's giving it to the girl. That's the indirect object. Now, in English, if the word order changes, then the meaning of the sentence changes. So if we move girl to the beginning, and we move the word pretty to in front of the word girl, and we move the word poet to the end, what do we have? We have the pretty girl gives a rose to a poet. It's completely different. First sentence, it's the poet giving, and in the second sentence, the poet is receiving. In the first sentence, it is the rose that is pretty. In the second sentence, it is the girl that is pretty. And in the first sentence, it's the girl that's receiving the rose. And in the second sentence, it's the girl who's giving the rose. So word order means everything in an English sentence. However, in Latin, it's completely different. It has nothing to do with word order. It has to do with the ending that it's attached to the word. So let's check this out. we got the same sentence. The poet gives a pretty rose to the girl. And we've gone ahead and translated this into Latin for us. Poeta puellae rosam bellam dat. Poeta is the subject, so it's got the nominative singular ending. Puellae is the word girl, and it is the indirect object, so it has the dative singular ending, ae. Uh, ros is what is being given, so it's the direct object. So it has the accusative singular ending, am. And then bellam is the adjective that's modifying rose. So it's also got the am, dative, uh, excuse me, accusative singular ending. And then dot is our verb, and it's third person singular, uh, he gives. So the poet, poeta, dot, gives uh, puellae to the girl. What does, she get? what is he giving to the girl? A bellam rosam, a beautiful, pretty rose. Now, you take that same sentence and rearrange all of those words. The second one is poeta rosam bellam puellae dot. The third one, rosam bellam puellae poeta dot. And the last one, dot bellam puellae rosam poeta. All the exact same words rearranged, and they all mean the same thing. The poet gives a pretty rose to the girl. You say that may be somewhat confusing. I know it's different than how we do things in English, but there's actually a whole lot of clarity that comes from being able to look at the ending to a word and uh, know how it's functioning in a sentence. Actually, in English, we have a problem all the time with pronouns. When, when you say something like he, uh, he hit him, you're like, wait, did he hit himself? He hit him? Like, which, who's the him? Who's the he? And if, if you had an ending that indicated su subject or indirect object or direct object, then you, you wouldn't have any questions. And this is actually the beauty of Latin. There's a whole lot of specificity that helps cut down on the ambiguity of a sentence. So let's take this one step further here. Oh, there's the, uh, the titles there, subject, indirect object, direct object, adjective, and verb. Let's change it up just a bit here. If you want to change the meaning you need to change the endings. So here's the first sentence, the poeta puella rosum bellum dot. The poet gives a pretty rose to a girl. But let's change the endings. Let's put, instead of puellae, A-E, let's put puella. And instead of poeta, let's put poetai. And let's see what else. We're gonna just change those two. So now we have the girl gives a pretty rose to a poet. We've simply changed who's giving and who's receiving. And the way we did that is by either changing it from a nominative to a dative or from a dative to a nominative ending. And then this last sentence, we changed rosa. Instead of rosam, we put rosa, which now it's the nominative ending, which means it's the subject. And we have rosa poetai, the rose dot gives uh, a pretty girl, puelam, to a poet. So the word girl is now the direct object. The rose is giving a pretty girl to a poet. That is, of course, a nonsensical statement. It makes no sense. But the ending tells you how the word functions in the sentence. 
And in this case, Rosa is the subject. It's the do thing doing the giving. And the word Puelam, girl, is the direct object. It is a thing being directly affected by the verb. So that's how nouns case noun case functions uh, in a sentence. All right, how do we translate these? Well, we've already alluded to it, but let's go ahead and give it a little bit more systematically here. If it's the subject, you just simply say whatever the noun is. In this case, aqua, the water. If it's genitive, again, we're going to say it's possessive right now, and our generic translation is going to be of the water. For dative, we're going to say to or for the water. For accusative, we're going to say the water, again, because it's like he drank the water. That's just simply how you translate it. Ablative, we're going to supply prepositions, by, with, or from, the water. And again, for vocative, oh, water, like you're calling to the water, oh, water, you're so, I don't know, cold, wet, delicious, I don't know. Plural, you got your plural endings on a qua, so you have a qui, a qua, a quis, a qua, a quis, a quai. It's the exact same translations as singular, but it's plural. The waters, of the waters, to or for the waters, the waters, by, with, or from the waters, and Oh, waters. So Latin does not have, this is a little note here, Latin does not have a definite or indefinite article, the word a or the. These must be supplied when you translate. So you won't find these uh, in, uh, unlike Greek, uh, in Latin, that we do not have them, so you have to supply them. All right, if you need to take a break, now's a good time to take a break. I'll keep on going. I'll be here when you get back. Let's talk about syntax or sentence construction in Latin. Syntax refers to the arrangement of words to form meaningful clauses and sentences. Even though word order doesn't necessarily matter in Latin, there are some basic patterns in Latin syntax. And the most basic sentence structure is this. You'll have it subject at the beginning with any modifiers, generally after, sometimes before. Then it'll be followed by the indirect object with its modifiers. Then the direct object with its modifiers. You'll have any adverbial phrases with their modifiers, which will come before the verb that they are modifying. And that verb usually ends, uh, completes the sentence. So here's a little, quick little note. Word order can change for the sake of emphasis and also in Latin poetry. So even though this is the basic structure, sometimes a Latin author would maybe put the verb near the beginning or at the, be at the beginning of a sentence. And he's doing this for emphasis purposes. Poetry, they did it for different reasons to make sure they keep with meter and time. And, and we'll talk about that when we get to poetry. But just know that this is the basic syntax, but it can deviate. And that's okay because we have the endings. We don't necessarily need word order to determine how to translate it. All right, here we go. Subject, indirect object, direct object, verb. That's the basic structure right there. Subject, indirect object, direct object, verb. All right, memorizing declension endings and their functions are critical to Latin translations. So you really need to know the endings and you need to know how these uh, cases function in a sentence. Now here's a caution. Some endings, as you've probably noticed, are the same for different cases. So you may have been wondering, oh my goodness, how in the world do we determine how it's functioning if it's repeated? You can see here clearly that AE is found in the dative and genitive singular as well as in the nominative and vocative plural. You can see that IS is found in the dative and ablative plural. And then A is found in both the nominative and vocative singular. And then, of course, you've got the ablative singular, which has an A, is an A, but it has that macron. So please notice that. That's actually a good thing. That macron tells us, oh, this is ablative singular. It's different than the nominative or vocative singular. But you have these similarities. So in these instances, context will generally tell you what the function of the word should be. So this is important. If you can't determine what it is initially, because it's got multiple options, then let context tell you how to translate the, uh, the noun. All right, and we'll put this into practical application in class. Lastly here, let's talk about adjectives. Now this is not too tricky. If you've learned the nominative, I mean, if you've learned the first declension noun endings, then you're gonna be able to handle adjectives just fine. Adjectives, of course, if you remember from English, are words that modify nouns. And in Latin, 
they can either come before or after where they modify, but generally will come after it. The word adjective comes from the Latin word ad iacere, ad iacere, which means to lay next to. And so this is a word that lays next to a noun, and it is modifying it here. Latin adjectives have masculine, feminine, and neuter forms. And then this is important. Adjectives must agree with the noun that they modify in case, number, and gender. So in other words, if the noun is the subject and it's masculine and it's singular, then the adjective also that's describing this word also has to be nominative, masculine, and singular. If the noun is feminine and it's accusative and it's plural, then the adjective that's modifying it also needs to be feminine, accusative, and plural. So that's important to remember. Now there are two different kinds of Latin adjectives. We'll talk about third declension later, but right now in this lesson, we're gonna be looking at first and second declension uh, adjectives. And those end in us or a or um depending on if it's masculine, feminine, or neuter, and that's in that order. Now, any adjective can be used to modify any noun, regardless of which declension. So you could actually use a third declension noun to modify a first declension noun, excuse me, a third declension adjective to modify a first declension noun. It doesn't matter as long as they agree in case, number, and gender. Let's put this into practical use here. We'll just start with the feminine adjective. The word for small is parwus, parwa, parwum. Here we've paired it with the word girl, puella, which is a first declension noun, feminine. So we have to use the feminine form of parwus, parwa, parwum. And that, of course, is parwa. So just like the noun, you take the stem, add the endings. You're going to do the exact same thing to the adjective. And so we end up with puella, pu parwa. Puelai, parwai, puelai, parwai, etc. That is uh, how we decline it. Just add those same endings. Uh, I, I, um, uh, uh, I, arum, is, as, is, I. Add that to your stem. Parv, parv, and that's how you decline it. Here's how you'll translate it. In the singular, this would be the small girl. In the genitive, it would be of the small girl. Dative, to or for the small girl. An accusative as a direct object, it would simply be the small girl. Ablative, by, with, or from the small girl. Invocative, oh, small girl. We're calling out to her. How about plural? Well, same exact translation. You simply make the word girls, girl, plural to girls. So the small girls of the small girls, to or for the small girls, the small girls, by, with, or from the small girls, and oh, small girls. All right. So this is our lesson. Uh, if you need to, go back and re-watch this video, replay any section that you may be struggling with. Don't forget to study your vocabulary. You'll be having a quiz on that uh, pretty soon. So go ahead and make sure you go over your vocabulary list. We'll talk about that in class as well. Have a great day.